Good afternoon, everyone. A very, very warm welcome to this session. My name is Russell Nash. I'm a solutions architect with Amazon Web Services, and I am delighted to be here today giving this talk to you. If you're trying to pick my accent, uh, I was born in England and emigrated to Australia a few years ago. On any given day, I either identify with being English or being Australian, depending on who's doing better in the cricket. Today I'm English uh, after Australia's absolutely shocking showing in the, uh, in the first Ashes test. Um, at the end of this session, we're going to have a bit of a Q&A uh, and we've got a few t-shirts to give away. So, uh, so please stick around and ask some, uh, ask some interesting questions um, and uh, we might be able to throw some t-shirts your way. Sorry. Oh, okay. Okay, just Q&A, no t-shirts. Um, we'll get to the agenda in a second, but I just wanted to give you a quick understanding of what this talk's going to be about. It's basically going to be a love story. It's a love story between big data and analytics and any scalable system that needs a lot of infrastructure. And it's a love story between those algorithms and those architectures and the cloud. Because a lot of the talks that you've heard in the last couple of days have been about doing things at scale. And if you do things at scale, you need a lot of infrastructure. And where's the best place to get a large amount of infrastructure? It's in the cloud. And so essentially, it's this fantastic, beautiful tale of uh, two systems um, that intertwine really well together. Uh, the actual agenda is pretty straightforward. I just want to say a couple of words about AWS, um, just in case you're not familiar with, uh, with Amazon Web Services. And then we're going to talk about the, the Lambda architecture, uh, which some of you might have heard of. And uh, this is a very dark slide. Ah, so for those of you who haven't heard of AWS, uh, we're a provider of cloud-based infrastructure, um, and we've got global uh, regions in many different places around the world, obviously primarily in the US, but also Europe uh, and Asia Pacific. Uh, and so any of our customers can use any of those regions to deploy um, their cloud-based infrastructure. Now, what you will notice is that there's currently no blue box in this area. Um, we're looking to change that. So we recently announced that we are going to open up um, some data centers within India, um, which will then give you uh, a local region uh, for you guys to deploy your infrastructure in. Um, so we're very excited about that, uh, and we're hoping our customers are as well. So we're looking for some time in 2016. Um, for that to kick off. So in terms of the, the services we provide, I'm obviously not going to go through all of this, but I just wanted to touch on a couple of points. At its most basic, we have compute. So you can spin up instances, uh, various flavors of Linux, various flavors of Windows, on varying different instance sizes depending on your workload, and then treat those machines as you would a normal on-premise machine. You can install on it whatever you like, you can do with it what, whatever you like. So as we go along, you can think about the fact that pretty much anything you want to do, you can just spin up machines that we call uh, EC2 machines uh, and use them as you would normally. But on top of that, we've also built a lot of platform services just to give you that higher level um, of management, just to take away some of the heavy lifting of actually getting some of these applications up and running. And so in the analytics space, um, and we're going to talk about some of these, we've got a managed Hadoop service, a uh, real-time streaming data service, a SQL analytics database, um, and a NoSQL database as well. And so these, as I said, are just designed to just get you up a level so that you're having to do less management of the infrastructure and can spend more time doing the fun stuff. Now, the other thing to note here is that on top of this, again, we have partners that actually will also remove even that level of abstraction and, and get you moving even faster. So we've got um, people like Qbol, for example, who will run um, their infrastructure on top of AWS um, to, to give you even more level um, of abstraction from the underlying um, management piece. Now, uh, one of the points I wanted to make as we go through this is that there's obviously many, many different ways to do anything that you want to do um, 
these days. There's lots of different open source uh, options. There's Amazon services. There's all sorts of third parties. And sometimes we can get a little bit focused on the particular piece that we know, um, and we kind of push that um, against other options. And so I wanted to make the point that um, it doesn't have to be that way. And I saw a quote the other day that I thought um, really summed this up quite well. Uh, and, and this was basically it. And it's true, right? So we, you know, people, we get very focused on the stuff we know. So we say, my database is better than your database. You know, no SQL is going to rule the world. Um, everything else is dead. And that's simply not the case. As you all know, every single technology has got its strengths and its weaknesses. And we certainly feel that. So we certainly feel that whatever's the best particular infrastructure for our customers will support that. We don't want to push you into a particular technology that we don't think is particularly uh, right for your workload. So let's get into the Lambda architecture. Now, for those of you who looked at the, the name of the talk, you might have said, that sounds suspiciously like the Lambda architecture. Why didn't he just call his talk the Lambda architecture? And the reason I didn't is because the word Lambda um, actually means a lot of different things now, and I didn't want to um, make it unclear as to what the talk was about. So let me cover off on a couple of those. So the first one is the, the Lambda architecture, which we're going to talk about. But confusingly, AWS has released a service called Lambda, which has got nothing to do with the Lambda architecture, although you can plug it into the Lambda architecture if you want to, just to make things confusing, and we'll talk about that a bit later on. Uh, what the Lambda service does is, is it is an event processing service where you can give us code, and we will then fire that code in, in, um, in response to an event, but you don't need to provide any infrastructure to run that code. We'll do that all for you. So we'll have a bit of a look at that later on. Uh, the third one is obviously Lambda Functions. So those of you familiar with functional programming might have used Lambda Functions. They're basically anonymous functions that you can use. And then there's a fourth one. Who was a teenager in the 1980s? Really? really? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> That's all right. You could admit it. We're, you know, we're part of the wise generation now. Um, so who remembers Revenge of the Nerds? Anybody remember that movie? <laughs> Some people do. So in Revenge of the Nerds, uh, the guys in there, they invented this uh, fake fraternity, a college fraternity, and they called it Lambda, Lambda, Lambda. So whenever I hear people talk about Lambda, it always reminds me of these very kind of nerdy guys running around trying to, um, trying to make it in, in college. So let's talk about the Lambda architecture. So the Lambda architecture was invented by a guy called Nathan Mars, who some of you might have heard of. He's got a little bit of street cred because he wrote Apache Storm. So he kind of knows what he's talking about. And his whole point was that a lot of batch processing systems, a lot of heavy duty data processing systems are overly complex. And so he says this, this great quote about complexity. And he talks about it in a couple of terms. He says, hardware is going to fail. Everybody knows that. But he says humans fail as well. You introduce errors when you do a release you suddenly realize you've got, you've got issues. You've got to make a system that you can easily fix, that you can easily roll back to a known state. And so that's why he invented the Lambda architecture. And basically, at its core, he's talking about large amounts of new data coming in. He says you have a batch layer. So you take that data and you put it into some kind of master store. And then you have a batch layer that then does your, your processing, your enrichment, your business logic. And then you place those views into the serving layer. And the serving layer, you then, you then query. Now, one of the keys to this architecture is that in the batch layer, you've got this, what he calls this immutable data store. He says you never update that data. You only append to it. If a value changes, you don't change it in that store. You simply add another record and you timestamp it. And the reason he said you do that is because then it's much easier to go back and recreate any of your views in the serving layer if you introduce some kind of issue. Now, he said that's all well and good, but what about if you want faster access to that data? So he introduces something he calls the speed layer. So the speed layer is designed to take those, those events, that data, those transactions, and get them into the serving layer very quickly. So it doesn't necessarily have the same level of enrichment, same level of, of business processing that goes on in the batch layer, but the data is there more quickly for you to query. And so then through the serving layer, you can query both 
the historical richer data and the newer, um, uh, maybe less rich data, and you can marry them together. And then eventually, the all the newer data, the the, the speed stuff, will get overwritten by the the historical stuff and, and enriched, etc. And so he talks about this. He said the stuff in the speed layer is only there for a very short time. So if you make a mistake in that layer, it doesn't really matter. Now, there's obviously a bunch of different ways you can implement that architecture. One of the common ways we see is the batch layer lends itself very much to some kind of Hadoop implementation. Um, Apache Kafka is a nice fit for that speed layer, that, that, um, that ingestion of very large volumes of data. And then some kind of database as your serving layer that you can then query. Now, if you wanted to run this in AWS on the cloud, you could obviously, as I said, you could just spin up EC2 machines, install Kafka, install Hadoop, install a database, manage that yourself, and off you go. But what I wanted to talk about was what if you want to use some of the higher level Amazon services, some of the platform services to remove some of that management underneath. And so we've got a couple of services that fit into those different areas. So I want to talk about uh, Amazon EMR, which is Elastic MapReduce. For the speed layer, I want to talk about Amazon Kinesis. And then for the database, we're going to touch on Amazon Redshift as well. And then once we're done with that, we're just going to very quickly look at a couple of alternate approaches as well. So let's have a look at, at EMR. So what is EMR? So EMR stands for Elastic MapReduce, and basically all it is is a managed Hadoop service. So if you think about your normal Hadoop stack, you get a bunch of machines, you install Hadoop on it, um, you get it, all the machines working, talking to each other, etc., and off you go. What Elastic MapReduce does is it doesn't replace that, but it manages that process for you. So what you would do is you would get onto the uh, EMR console, and you would say, I want this many machines, I want this distribution, um, go and do it for me. It'll spin up the machines, it'll install it all for you, make sure the master node's there, the data nodes are there, they're all talking, and then it ties a lovely red bow around it and hands it to you, um, and off you go. So you get a much faster time to start using the cluster rather than mucking around trying to get it to work. And then, of course, you can plug in all the other fun stuff on the top. So at the end of the day, it's just, it's just Hadoop, right? So you've got all access to all the... Um, uh, all the ecosystem that goes along with that. Why do people like EMR? The management is a big piece, that, that ability to get going quickly, the scale of it, and also the cost of it as well. And we'll look at that in a bit more detail. So in terms of the management of it, there are a number of ways you can spin up an EMR cluster. You can do it through the console. You can do it through the API, through the SDK, through the CLI, depending on what, what you want to do. If you go through the console, this is, this is part of the console. So we ask you questions about what do you want to call a cluster, how many machines do you want, blah, blah, blah. But we also say, what do you want installed on the cluster? So by default, obviously, we'll put the ubiquitous hive pig hue. But then we've got a drop down to say, do you want Spark on here, Impala, Ganglia, etc. So that kind of makes it easy to just say, this is what I want on my cluster. But often customers want more than what's on that list. And so you can use a bootstrap action to install whatever you like. So there's a whole bunch of, obviously, of other ecosystem components that aren't here. You can very easily install them as well. Now, here's a picture that you can't possibly read. Uh, <laughs> but the idea of this is just to show you the different families of instance types that we have. So at the end of the day, EMR is just running on, on EC2, EC2 being our virtual um, instances. And you've got a choice of a lot of different families of instance types. There's ones that are heavy in terms of disk, others that have got more memory, some that have got more CPU, depending on your workload. And they come in families. So this one here might be the kind of general purpose family. Um, so down the bottom is um, basically CPUs, and this axis here is memory. And so you can see, you can kind of pick where you want to be on the CPU versus memory um, map here and choose your instance types. So that gives you an enormous amount of flexibility to choose a different type of instance depending on your workload, depending on what you're trying to do. Now let's look at cost and time. Now this is really interesting because if you're buying your infrastructure, if you're renting your infrastructure by the hour, then to work out how much it's going to cost you is pretty straightforward. So if you look at this kind of equation, you've got basically on, 
on the, uh, I always forget which is which, I'm assuming, is that the y-axis, the one that goes up and down? Yeah, thanks. It's been a long time since I did that at school, because um, I was a teenager in the 80s, unlike, unlike you guys. Um, so as you can't see, um, <laughs> ah, so basically your equation is, uh, how many CPUs do I want to throw at it, and then how much time is that going to take? So to work out how much that's going to cost you is basically just whatever's under this red rectangle, right? So the more grunt you throw at it, um, it'll cost you more, but you might do it in less time. So let's say you have a job that takes five hours if you throw a moderate amount of CPU at it. But if you throw a lot of CPU at it, then it's only going to take one hour. But the size of that rectangle is the same, because you're only paying for your stuff by the hour. So you may as well just throw a lot of compute power at it and get it done quicker. Why would you not? And you can do this with the cloud because we've got a lot of infrastructure. Throw as much at it as you can, get your stuff done quicker, but don't necessarily pay any more for it. Now, there are other ways to save money as well with, with EMR. So let's look at this picture of a Dalmatian. We have another aspect of the EC2 market, which is called the spot market. So when you want to rent a, uh, an EC2 machine, you can do that uh, with what we call on-demand. So you can just say, give me, the, give me that machine right now on demand, and there's, a, and there's a price attached to that. But we also take any unused capacity and we allow you to bid on that. So for example, if an instance type was 20 cents, you might say, I'm prepared to pay 3 cents for that. And so there's a, there's a spot price that fluctuates, obviously, depending on demand. And if you bid for an instance and you're above the spot price, we'll give you that instance for whatever the spot price is. So how does that work with, with EMR? So let's say you spin up a cluster with four on-demand nodes and your job takes 14 hours. So the cost is those four instances, 14 hours at 50 cents. So let's say 50 cents is the on-demand price, the going rate for that particular instance. So that costs you $28. Now in scenario two, you keep your four on-demand nodes, but you add five spot nodes to that. So now, obviously, the duration comes down because you've got more grunt in your cluster. But look what happens to the price. So now, your four instances at 50 cents are only running for seven hours. They're only running for half the time. So they cost you a lot less. And then the five instances of the spot ones, let's just say you got them for 25 cents instead of 50 cents. So the total is 22.75. So you end up with this situation where the job's taken half as long and it's actually cost you less to run it. So that seems to break all kind of normal convention around, around buying things. Um, how can it take less time and also cost less? So you're asking yourself, what's the catch, right? Why don't I just run stuff like this all the time? So the catch is that if the spot price goes above your bid price, we will take it back. We will say, thanks, we'd like the spot instance back. So now you're thinking, well, that sounds pretty useless. If you're just going to take it off me, then how can I use it for long-running compute jobs? So what we did is within EMR, so this is looking into the internals of EMR, we introduced a particular group of nodes specifically to take advantage of spot. So you've got your master instance up the top. You don't want to lose that. You've got your core instance group here that have got HDFS attached. You don't want to lose those. But then we've got these task nodes. And so the task nodes do not have any disk attached to them. All they do is just processing. So if one of those goes away, it doesn't really matter. Hadoop's just going to take the job that that was running and give it to another node. And so this is where you can really take advantage of the spot market by using the task nodes. And so we have some customers that create massive Hadoop clusters with a lot of task instances on spot, they crunch through their stuff very quickly and um, doesn't cost them a lot of money to do that. So just to bring that point home, um, again, this is a, a screenshot from the, uh, from the EMR management console and a couple of things here. So this is where you can specify what instance types you want for the different nodes. So you've got your master, 
you've got your core nodes, and you can choose the different um, instance types. So I don't know if you can read that, but basically they're grouped into compute optimized, um, GPU instances if you want to use those, memory optimized, and storage optimized. And then down here, you've then got your task nodes, but you can create multiple different groups of task nodes, and potentially you can um, bid on the spot. So here, I've said for this group, I'm going to bid five cents, this group 10 cents, and this group 20 cents. And when you hover over that little um, information icon, it'll show you what the current spot price is. So you kind of know roughly what it is now, and so you can kind of work out what you want to bid for that. So the idea is that when I, when I kick it off, the spot price is obviously less than five cents. When I did this, it was about three and a half cents. But if it rises to eight cents, that's okay. These nodes will get taken away, but I've still got these. If it goes up again to 15 cents, again, I've, st I've got my backup here. So it allows you to kind of take this tiered approach to ensure that your job keeps going, even though the spot price might rise. So to give you an example, uh, when I did this, the, uh, the on-demand price for the M3X Large was um, about 27 cents, and the spot price was about 3.5 cents. So a big, big discount if you, want, if, you can, if you can use the spot market. The other nice thing about Elastic MapReduce is we've done a lot of work to optimize EMR talking to S3. So S3 is our simple storage service. It's an object store, highly scalable, highly durable, uh, a great place to store stuff. Um, if you've got content in S3, in S3 obviously, then makes it easy to share that with other applications. Um, obviously, feel free to share it with other Amazon applications, um, but also in any other application you're running on the cloud as well. Plus an added bonus that you can then archive off to Glacier. So Glacier is our low-cost um, cold storage, uh, and you can archive stuff off there and, again, save money on, on uh, storage. So that's, uh, so that's uh, Elastic MapReduce. So let me talk a little bit about Kinesis. So Kinesis is uh, very similar to, to Kafka, if, you, if you're familiar with Kafka, quite similar in its design. Basically, the idea is that you have a bunch of data sources, whether you're trying to capture sensor data or whether it's clickstream data, um, whatever it might be. Kinesis sits across three availability zones. So an availability zone for us is basically a data center. So you can think of it as a physically separate location. So we'll write every message to three physically separate locations when we receive it. And you create a stream within the Kinesis service. That gives you an endpoint that those devices can then talk to. You push it into Kinesis, and then at the back end, you then have your consuming applications that read from the stream. So what we see quite a lot is people just doing logging, for example, reading from the stream. They want a, they want a log of every event. They just write that straight out to S3. You might want to do some uh, real-time metrics, though. So they might take KPIs out of the stream and write that to a NoSQL database, put a dashboard on top of that. Then you might want to do longer term analysis. So you might push that into Redshift, for example. Um, or you might want to push it into a non-Amazon service. So there's a spout for Apache Storm. There's an Elastic Search interface uh, and others as well. So Kinesis is designed to do that real-time capture uh, and store that durably for you. Um, just a quick point about um, how you scale Kinesis. So your point of scale is called a shard, and a shard will give you a thousand transactions a second or one meg of data. So if you need five thousand transactions a second, you go for five shards. Okay, and you can you can scale that up. If you want to get data out, you can do that in a couple of ways. So you can have EC2 instances at the back end that have these worker uh, threads running on them. Each of those workers talks to a shard and pulls data off the shard and then does something with it. We've also uh, built a client library uh, around this to make it a bit easier to write these applications, and that's available in Java, Node, Python, .NET, uh, and Ruby. Anything else we didn't cover there? Any particular language that you wish? Anything? No? Covered at all? Covered all bases? Scarlet. Yeah, okay, okay. 
service teams love to hear feedback, so uh, uh, I'll pass that back. Um, so, as I said, so you can spin up EC2 machines and you can run, uh, you can run your, um, your applications on that. But this is where the AWS Lambda service can potentially come in. So you can give us code, which we will then run in response to a Kinesis event. So when a, a transaction hits Kinesis, we'll then run your code to then deal with that. Now the great thing about Lambda is there's no infrastructure underneath it that you have to manage. You basically pay for it in 100 millisecond increments. That's what it's designed for, short, sharp event uh, processing. That's currently available in Node uh, and Java, uh, and we'll add more as we go on. Uh, how is Kinesis different from Kafka? I know that you're all asking yourselves. In many ways, they're very similar. So in terms of latency, very low. Okay, we're talking about real-time processing, so it better be pretty, pretty, uh, pretty responsive. They can both scale up to very large volumes. They both respect the ordering of events as they come into the, um, into the stream. This is where they differ slightly. So the persistence for Kinesis is currently 24 hours. So we will hold events and messages in Kinesis for 24 hours before they age out. That's configurable in Kafka. Um, in terms of the payload, that can currently be one meg in Kinesis for each message. Again, that's configurable in Kafka. In terms of whether it's a managed service, Kinesis is a managed service, Kafka's not. So again, we don't want to be religious about it. This is what Kinesis does. If your use case doesn't fit that, that's totally fine. So that's Kinesis. Let me talk quickly about Amazon Redshift. So Amazon Redshift is an MPP SQL Analytics database. So MPP standing for Massively Parallel Processing. And I like to compare it to the traditional SQL databases that we all know and love, just so you can kind of get a handle on how they fit. So in terms of the type of databases, they're both SQL relational databases. So sometimes people think of uh, databases like Redshift, the MPP databases, as being not relational. Maybe they're NoSQL or can I do joins with tables? It's fully relational, fully ANSI standard SQL. The difference, though, is in the architecture, not in the, not in the layer that you see as a database user. So SMP, it's a bit of a 90s term, um, stands for symmetric multiprocessing, which basically means that your traditional SQL databases scale really well in a single box or in a small cluster, because they share resources really well. So I like to think of the, uh, the traditional SQL databases a bit like my seven-year-old, loves to share. Always sharing, sharing food, sharing toys, great sharer. The MPP databases are like my four-year-old, no sharing, hates to share, but which is bad with kids. It's fantastic if you're trying to scale a database. So the reason that the MPP databases scale to very large volumes is because each node is a standalone unit. It doesn't share disk, CPU, or memory with other nodes. So there's no contention as you add more nodes to it. So in terms of scaling, SMP goes vertical, you need a bigger box. MPP databases scale horizontally. Now in terms of the storage, traditional databases usually store their data in rows, which is great for online transaction processing, not so great for analytical types of queries because you end up reading a lot of redundant data. Redshift is also a columnar database, so it means that we store the data in columns rather than rows. So when you're asking an analytical, analytical query where you only want maybe a few columns in a table, but you want a lot of rows, it's fantastic for that. Goes to the disk and then just runs straight down the, um, the disk and pulls all the data out. Which leads us to the workload. So traditional SQL databases, fantastic for transactional workloads. That's what they're built for. Databases like Redshift, built for analytical workloads. Now, uh, I hate it when, uh, sorry, Vault DB. Um, let me let me come to that in a sec. So, uh, I hate it when vendors put up benchmarks that show you how fantastic their database is. Um, that was not the purpose of putting this up, actually. Although Redshift does do quite well on this comparison, um, 
this was more uh, kind of a bit of a statement about where the industry is going. So this was an AmpLab big data benchmark done about a year ago. And so you can see um, Hive obviously is pretty slow. Um, Tez has helped a bit. Um, but then you see things like Impala um, obviously bringing that, that query time down uh, and Redshift very much kind of in that interactive type of query um, bucket there. The other interesting thing about this is um, Shark already deprecated. Um, so if they ran this again today, you'd probably see things like Presto up there uh, and obviously not Shark. Yeah, so um, so kind of kind of similar in some ways. BigQuery is a bit more of a of a black box. You don't quite um, you don't quite have access to all the ANSI standard SQL um, in there, um, and it's not quite as compliant in terms of um, front ends as something like Redshift. The other thing about Redshift that we like is is the scalability of it. So you can start very small, so you can start with a node of 160 gig, and then you can add nodes as you go, and then if you really get into it, you can scale up to two petabytes if you need to. So plenty of headroom there, plenty of scalability um, to, uh, to allow you to grow into it. So that's, so that's basically it. So that's the, um, that's the, the kind of the, the AWS view of the Lambda architecture. Now, as I said, um, we don't want to be prescriptive about this, and there's many different ways to do this. So one of the things that we've seen recently is people using Spark, for example, in here. So um, using Spark streaming and, and Spark SQL uh, on Hadoop, talking to Kinesis, so not using Redshift, using Spark SQL and, and Spark streaming. Um, and then just very recently, our friends at Kubol um, open-sourced a Presto connector for Kinesis. So again, you can then, so Presto is basically an MPP um, open source product that sits on top of Hadoop. Um, that talks to HDFS, talks to S3, and now talks to Kinesis as well. So a great way to kind of get a SQL interface and query multiple different data sources. So a lot of different ways to, to skin the cat here. Um, but, um, but really exciting to kind of to, to be part of that. Thanks very much, guys. Any uh, any questions? Now remember, before you get excited about asking questions, there's no t-shirts. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, I have an update. There is t-shirt. Do we have t-shirts? We can get t-shirts. How many t-shirts have we got? Oh, we th maybe we've thrown the t-shirts away now. Have we have we given the. T Let's. Five, let's do five questions, yep. So was your was your question around what what level of compliance yeah. is there? From the various industry perspective. Yeah. So so let me let me see if I got your question right. So your question was what kind of level of compliance, compliance can I get yes. versus various industry uh, regulators etc yes. on the cloud? Yes. Um, Especially from the AWS um, Amazon perspective. Amazon yeah, AWS. Yeah, so if you if you go to our website, you'll see we've got a whole section in there on risk and compliance, okay. and you'll see there's all sorts of um, different uh, reports you can get. There's SOC reports, ISO reports, um, PCI reports, all sorts of stuff that will give you that, that level of compliance. Okay. And we've got a couple of really good white papers that will talk through that as well. Uh, and uh, <coughs> for example, you, have, you talked about uh, Hadoop. Uh, can we? How can we move already on-premises data into the uh, AWS? Uh, because we, for example, I have 10 terabytes of data. How can I move to AWS uh, uh, on-premises to the cloud? So, is there any example? Any suggestion you can make? How we can give our suggestion to the customer? 
Yeah, so the question was, if I've got a lot of on-premise data, how do I get that into, into the cloud? So there's a couple of options. So you can either, um, if there's a lot of it, you could use something like um, uh, Tsunami, for example, um, UDP, which will give you, it's basically a WAN optimization software. So that will maximize your bandwidth when you're pushing stuff into AWS. Um, or you can, uh, you can potentially put it onto a disk and ship it to us, which sounds a bit old school, but you can fit a lot of data on a disk. Yeah, so if you, if you send us the disk, we'll then put the data in S3 for you and send the disk back. Yeah, so if you've got 10 terabytes, that might be a good way to go. Yeah, so the question is what, uh, so there was never an S2, there's always just been an S3, um, but, um, but S3, so we write everything from S3 across three data centers, so very highly durable, so you get 11 nines of, of durability, um, and basically you can scale it up, you know, as much as you like to in terms of pushing data in. Um, so there's the CLI, there's an SDK for you to run that on premise, and then push that data in into, uh, into Amazon. Yeah, sorry, let me, <laughs> let me, do you want to, we'll take that offline, um, yeah, because we, we can't give you type 5 t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> what is the kind of Yeah, so within, within Redshift, on a, on a node, you've got obviously the disks attached to the node. Now we will mirror the data from each disk onto a disk on a separate node. So the, any data that you put in there will have a primary partition and a mirror partition. So we take care of that underneath the covers. So you'll always have your data in two places. We'll also back it up to S3 as well. So you'll also have an S3 copy of that data as well. Do you mean if, if you're in the middle of a query? Yeah, one of the stages gets created within the query. So, so does that happen? You said one of the stages created within the running map and you're again for the same stage, not for the previous stages. Right, okay. So, so Redshift, um, it's not quite analogous to, to MapReduce. So basically, it will push the SQL query down into the nodes, and then the nodes will then run that SQL query against their data set. So there's not quite that concept of, of stages. Um, if you kill the query halfway through, then basically that query will roll back completely. So it's, it's less of a kind of a long-running batch processing engine. It's more of an interactive database. It, it, exactly, yeah, yeah.